Today we are discovering what secrets Survivor Cook Islands did not tell us in the edited television show. We are going to look at secrets that are game related, some that are personal thoughts, and some that are just plain silly. And we will even find out all the details on why Survivor chose to do race wars, everyone's opinions about it, how some people quit because of it, and even see Fox rip CBS to shreds for doing so. Basically, as long as it isn't part of the show that aired on television, it is fair game to be considered a secret. And while most of the secrets here are focused on season 13 Cook Islands, some of them do apply to Survivor as a whole. With that, thanks for watching Once Upon an Island. Liking and subscribing really helps. And if you want to pick what videos I make and watch every video weeks and even months early, then consider supporting the channel on Patreon. Patreon makes everything here possible and allows the channel to be free of people paying us to say nice things about their products. Thank you for your support. Heads up, this list contains the secrets that I personally found to be the most interesting. Not every single secret in existence about this season is in this video. So with that, let's count all 46 of them in absolutely no particular order. 39 days, 20 people, one survivor. Number one, straight up, a lot of the secrets on this list will cover the gamut of reactions to the race wars twist good and bad. You're going to hear why they chose to do it. You're going to hear people on the streets reaction to it, how the players reacted. And as I mentioned earlier, Fox just kind of ripping CBS to shreds for doing so. If that's okay with you, then prepare yourself because it's a lot. This first secret is us hearing from Jeff Probst and Mark Burnett talking about the twist and the cast this season. The whole notion came from the fact that we were criticized so often for having a, a, a show that was not ethnically diverse. And the reason for that is that the people who apply are basically white, Caucasian. That's 80% of our applicants. I thought to myself, that's an interesting way to start it. Let people obviously be in their own ethnic tribes, knowing that, of course, Survivor mixes up over and over and over. And as a result, we found this really fresh cast of people who aren't Survivor addicts. They really don't know the show that well, but they thought the adventure sounded cool. Number two, we then hear from advocates of equality who definitely do not want to see this race twist take place. And remember, these are the absolute best answers TV Guide could get to not make CBS look bad. The twist this year for Survivor is obviously provocative. Uh, we definitely need to see how it is executed in order to comment on its social impact. I think it causes us to still think of uh, the differences that exist among different races rather than the commonalities. I have a problem with this. You know, for years we've been laboring to be integrated, to be an integrated society. Now we're going to pit one group against the other. It doesn't speak very well. Number three, you better believe that when this twist was revealed to the public that Fox took full advantage of parodying this on their SNL-like show, Mad TV with Key and Peele. They have a knockoff Jeff Probst and everything. It, it's a whole thing. Every day we're forced to live and work with people of different ethnicities. Wouldn't it be nice if we could be split up and compartmentalized like it used to be? This season we've separated the groups based solely on their race. African Americans. Asian Americans, Mexican Americans, and real Americans. Survivor, only on CBS, the Caucasian Broadcasting System. Number four, I noticed that for the TV Guide preview that took place before the season and after the season, the previous winners always hosted the TV Guide preview. And even after the season, the previous winners host those TV Guide previews. But for Cook Islands, they chose Suri. Now don't get me wrong, I like her more than Aris, but I feel like she was chosen for a reason. Now the question some of you may have is, did any of the castaways know this twist was going to take place before the season began? I think it's great to see so many diverse faces. I hope, uh, I'm a little bit leery, it might be kind of a twist, some sort of a war of the races kind of thing going on. Number five, at the time, Les Moonves ran CBS and he is married to Julie Chen of Big Brother fame. I only mention her because when he explains his thoughts on them doing this twist and why they chose to do it and how we thought it would be okay to do, he brings her up. Mark Burnett came up with the idea of doing Divided by Race, which I was very hesitant about. Is this a good thing for America? Is it a bad thing? Is it gonna be exploitive? Is our people gonna be, look at us like we're just doing this for ratings purposes and we didn't care that it was gonna hurt the fabric of society? Um, and I gave it a lot of, a lot of thought. You know, and I talked with Mark a number of times, 
And I talked with outside people about how they felt. And once again, I got mixed, you know, from friends of mine and, and you know, who are leaders in the African-American, you know, uh, culture. And, uh, you know, my wife is an Asian-American. I said, how do you feel about it? And we just had the finale this past Sunday and I watched it. I'm sort of really proud. I think overall, you know, the things that came out of it, you know, and, and it was won by an Asian-American man. And he said, you know what? I'm really pleased I was able to show, you know, against the stereotype, you know. And by the way, it was watched by 15 million people. Number six, Mad TV didn't stop with that one joke I showed you earlier. Oh no, they went all out and will be appearing in this video a few times. Here they make fun of all the swimming challenges you see on the show. Our next challenge is for reward. To win, you're going to have to swim 200 yards out into the ocean. Come on, man. That's like the eighth swimming challenge, dog. When are we going to have a basketball challenge? It's a swim challenge. Team White Bread, you can use your canoe. What? First team back with the flag wins. Want to know what you're playing for? Bucket of fried chicken. I got it. Here it is. Let's go. Give me the chicken. CBS, continuing blatant stereotypes. Number seven, the TV guide preview for the season does something I really like that they don't do for any of their other ones that I've watched so far. That is, they ask people on the street about what they think about the upcoming twist on the show. They get a good variety of takes that I will show here, and I'm gonna show you some more later. I don't think it's a healthy twist for the show. I think it was better when it was all about group efforts, when it was about you know working together no matter what race you are. You can have black, white, uh, Chinese on the same team, it doesn't matter. It shouldn't be uh, splitting them up like that. And me being multiracial, what do you do if you're that, if you're multi, you know, you can't be a survivor? It's not a good, it's not a good thing to do. I think they're kind of doing it to get more publicity because, you know, any publicity is good publicity, even though this is going to be probably be more negative than good. Number eight, on Rob has a podcast when talking with Yule about his Winners at War game, Cook Islands was briefly touched upon, and Yule says, if I had known about this race wars twist beforehand, things would have been different. And so when I got the opportunity to be on Survivor, like they didn't tell us it was going to be a race war, and if I'd known, I definitely wouldn't have done it because I just think that's such a terrible idea. Mm -hmm. um, sure. But, you know, I, I didn't know why they reached out, but I just figured, look, this is an opportunity for me to kind of represent my community. And it's the kind of opportunity that probably doesn't happen very often. Survivor Cook Islands, I think, was helpful in terms of just getting more people of color on television. And for that, I'm grateful. I think the premise under which they did it was something that like, I thought was really dangerous and really risky. Um, when they finally told us about the racial format, once we got to the island, I, I was thinking really hard about quitting, um, mainly because I thought, there are lots of different ways a show could end, and most of them I thought were just really bad. Like, so hypothetically, what if all the people of color got voted out by the white tribe? Like, that's clearly not gonna send a very positive message. What if my tribe, the Asian tribe, ends up like wiping out everyone else? I mean, that I don't think is gonna be something that's gonna be moving race relations forward. But I figured, you know, even if I quit, like the show was still gonna go on, and at least if I played, I might have some role in kind of shaping how the game plays out and what the final ending is going to be. Number nine, so many people this season were recruited. It's a lot and it is something the show struggles to move away from for many years to come. However, some gems do come out of this recruiting and one of them is Jonathan Penner who acted in many funny TV shows over the years, like in The Nanny when he is in love with the lead actress. Granny, I still want you and uh, something tells me you still want me too. Franny, fine. Will you marry me? So? So I'm gonna have to think about it. I think I've outgrown you. No, honey, you're just wearing heels. <laughs> hey, are you dumping me? No, I would never. Come to think of it, I think I am. Number 10, in a deep dive interview with Billy, links in the description, he gives so much dirt on the season. I'm not even gonna include everything in this video because it's an hour full of just like dirt on Cook Islands. Some of it even seems unbelievable. I highly recommend listening to it though. Anyways, here he talks about how the players were told about the race horse twist right before the season began and how Sundra actually replaced somebody at the last minute. I was mad about it. And when I was told about it, about eight hours before the game started, we were, we were one by one told about it. We were taken to a tent. Mark Burnett, Jeff Probst, and a couple other producers sat behind the table. We sat in front of the table. They broke the news to us. Turns out they had a person quit already, that somebody had figured it out. We were there for five days before the game started 
for several reasons, press and all that. She was a WNBA player that was going to be on the African-American tribe. And so she told them that she spent the whole life getting away from the whole race issue. She wasn't about to dive head first into it. Sundra, who, who made it to the final four? Yeah. She was the replacement on the African-American tribe. Number 11, Penner was a recruit. Sandra was a recruit. Even JP was a recruit. Billy talks about how JP being a recruit and his lack of game knowledge came up pretty often on the island. JP was on there because of this side deal that he had. He had no idea how survival works. No idea. We won immunity. And he thought that had nothing to do with anything. Every tribe was going to go to tribal council and vote somebody out. No, no. And so he was <laughs> he was yelling at me because he said, I gave my word to this alliance and they want me to vote out Christina. And I'm like, OK, I'll vote her out. But we're we're not going to tribal council. I can't vote her out. I got to wait till we lose. And they're like, no, you said you said that you're with us. And I'm like, I am with you, but I can't vote her out. We won. He's like, no. You gave your word. What do you want me to do? Write her name on a coconut? I can't, I can't do anything. Number 12. Did you know Rebecca from the season worked on The View as a makeup artist for Elizabeth Hasselbeck from season two when she played? I had no idea. I'm a makeup artist for The View, and Elizabeth Hasselbeck from season two is... Um is one of the people that I work on daily. Rebecca, you're a makeup artist, Emmy winning makeup am. artist and from I'm The View. I am co-hosting on Monday with Whoa, my girl. Whoa, how so about excited. that? All right. Tune in for more Survivor Dish. Number 13. As we learned earlier, Sandra was recruited and her IMDb is loaded after she plays on Survivor with so many acting credits, though most of it is on shows I've never heard of. One I have heard of though is CSI Miami where she plays a dead body. I think somebody put Dr. Garza on display. And that somebody just got our attention. Yeah! Number 14. As some of you may know, Parvati was a boxer. I know this is presented as her profession on the show, but footage of her actually doing this is really hard to come by. But I did find one clip. She thinks she's bad, but I'm going to knock her out in the first round. Maybe uppercut to the body, knock the wind out of her. Nice job. You know, Shallow really utilizing her jab. And that's something that... I think more of the ladies can do is instead of trying to throw combinations left and right haymakers, that jab can be very effective if you can fling it out there. And Shallow's done a nice job, but a good right hand landed by Noonan. You know, Parvati Shallow is not only a big hit in the ring, but she's a huge hit outside the ring as well. Number 15. On the early show, Seiku is awesome. I wish he had lasted longer on the actual show, but he says, yeah, like the others, I was recruited as well onto the show. Well, I was recruited. Uh, I was called probably in the last stages of the uh, selection. Right. And uh, I got a call on Friday, and on uh, next Thursday, I was sequestered away. And, and, and off you go. And, off you go. And I was gone, yeah. Number 16. Mad TV is back with another joke on Survivor where they make fun of the bias towards white people the show seems to have. In this challenge, the first team to build a fire wins. You'll each be given materials to help you. <laughs> Team Chicken and Waffles, you get a glass of water. What? And Team White Bread, you get this fire starting kit. Contains an assortment of dried twigs, a can of gasoline, a lighter, a bag of charcoal, as well as a DVD on how to start a fire. Find out who wins on the next Survivor. Number 17. In an online interview Jeff did before season 40 aired, he briefly talks about why the show made the now infamous change from a final two to a final three. Final two or final three? Final three. Because the final two allows you to drag the, the loser and three makes it a little more complicated. Number 18. Here we go. Jeff's bad pick for the season. Who does he have up his sleeve this time? Who does he think is gonna make it super far that actually doesn't make it very far at all? I have black belts in both karate and judo, but my favorite uh, martial art is actually uh, wrestling. That's my thing. He just seems extremely likable. It'd be hard to vote him out, especially early. I think he'll be around for a while. So you're absolutely sincere right now. I'm dead serious. Number 19. Billy claims in his interview they recently did, the one that I keep referencing, that the show set him up to fall in love with someone, to pretend that he had fallen in love with someone. I will leave that up to you to decide whether this is true or not. However, in his final words, his love for Candace continues. I got to meet some new people and uh, uh, I got to maybe even have that moment of love at first sight 
hopefully I'll be able to meet her again down the road. My two biggest regrets is that uh, number one, I didn't get to hook up with Candace. Hopefully I meet her outside the game. My prize was that I, I, fell, in, I, I fell in love in this game. Love at first sight. Her name is Candace. And uh, in between... <laughs> Candace from Ruro Tribe. Yeah, after the last challenge, we sort of mouthed the words, I love you to one another. And so that was my prize. And my prize was her. I've never heard anything that surprised me more than what you just said. I think it's just, you know, love at first sight. I think it's just a, 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 a rapport thing. So you're absolutely sincere right now. I'm dead serious. Number 20. With the wide array of reactions in an era before Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram were really a thing, people needed to voice their displeasure with the show somehow, and MySpace wasn't cutting it. Some even went to New York to protest during Billy's early morning interview. They decided to hold the early show outside that day for whatever reason. And yeah, there were a lot of Survivor fans. A couple of them even came all the way from Poland and from some other long, faraway places just for that. But the protests were also out of force. They wanted Survivor shut down, the season to never air. And so they were out there. They had to have security surround the area where they put the chairs, where me and the host of the early show were doing our, our, our interview. When the interview was over, my hand that grabbed me, pulled me over to a couple of, of survivors that came a long distance to take pictures, and then we rushed inside to get the hell out of there. Number 21, Seiku is a gem. Have I mentioned this? Because he really is. I'm highly impressed with him in terms of what I saw in his early show interview. So did you know he actually put out a jazz album after the season aired? I will put a link in the description to find it. And we should tell people you're a renowned jazz musician and you have a CD coming out when? Yes, I have a CD coming out, gonna be released 2007, right after the finale, and right. it's called The Next Level. Number 22, this one didn't happen until very late in Seinfeld's run when people were hotly anticipating the eventual disappointing finale, but in season in nine, Jonathan Penner makes an appearance when Newman and Kramer start a rickshaw business. Well, this is the first day of the rest of my life. Number 23. I mentioned earlier that I would show some more reactions of people at the time to the upcoming race twist. Well, here they are. And I'm pretty sure the guy who speaks last is the opinion that most of us had after it was over. I think that people would be uh, more likely to stay loyal to a race versus having alliances with other people like we usually do. I definitely root for the Hispanics. They seem to have the most luck these days and uh, I work with a bunch of Hispanic guys so I figure I'll kind of root for the home team even though I'm Caucasian. They call surviving. If you want to survive, stick with your own race. Honestly, I think people are going to go with people they like. Doesn't really matter. I mean, in the end, you know, jerk's a jerk and people are going to stay away from the jerks. Number 24, when Mad TV parodied Survivor, they asked, who would win while forgetting that one time Vesepia won? And this is a bit more amusing considering who does win the very next season. These four teams will compete for the right to win one million dollars. Will it be the Asian, the Mexican, or the white? Find out this season on Survivor. Only on CBS, the Caucasian Broadcasting System. Number 25, the Travel Council set this season is amazing. I love when production goes all out and here they did just that with a broken down shipwreck. Here are all the details of what went into making this masterpiece. So when we got here, there was absolutely nothing on this piece of land and the incredible Survivor Art Department constructed a 100 foot long shipwreck. The masts are 70 feet tall. They weigh about three tons each. There are three of them. And as you take a look around and see some of the nooks and crannies, this is, without question, the biggest build we've ever done for Tribal with the most detail, and it is stunning. Six weeks, 12 guys nonstop to build this, not including the design. Any of the materials we had to get, which is a lot of timber, came from New Zealand because there's nothing on the island. Number 26, the TV guide preview for each season is pretty fun and provides a lot of interesting details for those like me or you who want to know everything we can. Those of us who seek knowledge, no matter how useless it is. What the previews also provide are scripts written by hack writers. Why would they have Cerise say she didn't want to go back to tribal? Heck yeah, she wants to go back to tribal. Thanks, Jeff. 
I hope I never have to visit tribal council again. Number 27. While Jeff foolishly said he thinks Billy will make it far earlier on in this video, he must have joined the Make-A-Wish Foundation because this one was actually granted. With a Yale doctorate, a compassionate nature, and a whole batch of imposing muscle, Yule Kwan is the type of renaissance man who has a great shot at winning the game. Yule could absolutely win this game. I'd be delighted if he did. He's a super likable guy. Number 28, Cook Islands is gorgeous, and to travel there is not cheap, nor is it quick. As Billy explains, it took a long time, and his handler hated the traveling. Well, it was a 36-hour trip from LaGuardia all the way to the Cook Islands, with wow. the last few hours being on a propeller plane where we felt every motion of the plane, and one of the handlers there, God bless her, she was screaming bloody murder the entire flight. Every time the plane would do a bank left or a bank right, like, you would feel it in your stomach. It was like an elevator, like when you when an elevator drops quickly in, in, in a big city, but now instead of it being up and down, what you're used to, it's left and right, what you're not used to. So this poor handler was screaming bloody murder. And I was like, yeah, this is what I signed up for. <laughs> Number 29, the marooning at the beginning of the season is awesome. It's fast, it starts right away, and gives us more time on each tribe's beach to learn about the players, which is what we all really want in a premiere. What we didn't know is how the show needed shark wranglers at the marooning to keep the players safe. And, and Jeff Pro was like, go overboard, go overboard. I swear to God, they cut this from the from the whole thing. But you saw 20 people go, ah, I don't know about this. Ah. Maybe you can call it instinct that picked in. Maybe, maybe those stereotypes are true. But we acted like we stole stuff and we jumped. <laughs> we jumped. When I, got, when I went underwater with all this heavy stuff that weighed me down, that's when I kind of had a moment to look around. And they were shark wranglers all around our raft and that boat. And I was like, oh, these people, God bless them. They're going to die for me. <laughs> Number 30. On the early show with Cecilia, we learn of another romance taking place on i2, and it had nothing to do with Billy or Candace. Whatever's going on between JP and I is, is totally innocent. And I'm cute, so why not? Yeah, I think Cecilia and I are flirting a little bit. We're getting a little snuggly at night. All because of body heat, that's why. I mean, do you see all that muscle goodness he has on him? It's all that good stuff. How can you not cuddle up to him in those cold, cold nights when the rats are running all over your head? Yeah. Number 31. In JP's interview, he says, oh yeah, that whole thing with Cecilia, that was nothing. There was no romance whatsoever. But then the show says, we have a secret scene, and JP's like, ah, oh, crap, why do they have a secret scene about me? Well, we want to take a look at this week's secret scene, because unbeknownst to a lot of folks, you are really having a serious problem with your foot. Let's take a look. Oh, man. Number 32. In Cowboy's final words, he completely dishes on some of Yule's medical problems that I don't recall seeing on the show, and uh, he gets bleeped when talking about them. I'm not sure if that's because it's a medical thing that he's talking about, or just because it's that gross and not okay for even a DVD extra. Either way, I'm a bit surprised. Yo was actually having hemorrhoids and getting blood, so I don't think he's that strong. Number 33. Remember when everyone is paddling to their camps and on the way, Cowboy makes some Asian jokes that his tribe told him to stop doing? Well, as it turns out, those weren't the only jokes he was saying. And I can see why some would be offended by this guy they just met. And, and, and Cowboy was sort of being the general, or at least this outspoken person of the of the tribe. And he, the first thing he tells to us is like, you're going the wrong way, Cuba's that way. <laughs> <laughs> I found it funny, but his own tribe was like, no, shh, you can't say stuff like that. Number 34. This next story is a bit hard to believe, but I can't prove otherwise with footage from the show. But apparently, Billy claims his pants caught fire during the first immunity challenge. The biggest moment for me in, in Survivor didn't get aired, which is when I got set on fire by my own tribe. And Christina was the one chosen for to, to, to be the torchbearer. When we got to the platform, she went to go step on it off the boat. And because it's in water, it dipped and all the kerosene spilled onto my backside. Well, not all of it, but a lot of it. When it came time to go up the ladder, 
you know, I'm they're going up the ladder that everybody else went first except for me and, and Christina because the rule was the torchbearer goes last. So I go up, but while I'm doing that, Christina's still climbing and she lights me on fire. And Jeff Probes is 10 feet away from me on the top of the platform, 10 feet away, not even that far, 10 feet away. And he's yelling, Billy's on fire. He's engulfed in flames. Mark Burnett and, 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 and David Burst are about 30 feet away from me. They were all there. Nobody did shit. <laughs> they just all no. watched me burn. They just all watched me burn. And I turned around and told Christina, you're burning me. She's like, oh, I'm sorry. Like, it didn't matter all that much to her at the time. <laughs> I get to the ladder, to the top of the to the platform, and I put myself out. Christina's there standing. When I look up, Christina's there standing me there in shock. Like, she finally got the, you know, I guess she finally saw that I was on fire. And she's there in shock. I'm like, what are you doing? Go light the cauldron. Win the challenge. So she goes light the cauldron. And what does my rest of my tribe do? They come over. Billy, are you okay? Nope. They go, yay, we won. So when the old challenge is over, and I go up to Jeff Probst, and I go, was it just me or was I on fire just during this challenge? And his reaction was like, oh, my God, it was so awesome. You were in a blaze, and it was incredible. It, and I was like, okay. To the fans that want to just verify, go to the two episodes. And remember that we all we got is the clothes on our backs. Go to two episodes and look at my shorts in the first episode. Look at my shorts in the second episode. Where did those second set of shorts come from? Number 35, when Cowboy gets interviewed on the early show, we get a secret scene where he is showcased doing some more healing on the island. And Christina, who is sitting right next to him, is pretty much just kind of ignored. No, 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 no. Let me open the circulation. No. Take it. Okay. The Tangaroa, God of Fertility. Oh, no, okay. That's enough. That's yeah. enough. All the tendons and ligament around it. He knows everything Cowboy does. I love it. Number 36, as Jessica, aka Flicka's early morning interview comes to a close, she says, oh, by the way, I'm making a website for people to buy things I make. Remember, Etsy wasn't really a thing yet, and the host insults her. Check out flickaflame.com, I'm getting that going. You'll be able to buy custom made things from me and hopefully well, hire me to do some stilt walking or yeah, some fire great. effects. See, and, all right, see, you give you know, somebody a rope and they think they're yeah. a cowboy. I had to look it up to double check, but what the host is saying here is generally referred to as an insult you say towards someone whose behavior has gone too far. Number 37. When Nate gets voted out, he is so, so mad with Penner. He's a little mad at Ozzy and everyone else he's like, you're all cool. But Penner, screw you, dude. Jonathan, you can kiss my For real, kiss my You a dirty, stanky, whack fruitcake who sold me out like a dirty, I don't even know how to say it. You just a dirty. So kiss my ass, Jonathan. Definitely. When you watch it with your family, kiss my ass. Teach your kids know nothing about your little fake old speeches about integrity and this and that and come in the game straight face. You sold out our tribe when we brought you in. You trading bastard. Ozzy, I thought you were cool meeting you, but you was a little dirty punk too. Um, so you can kiss my ass too. Jonathan, let me one more time. You can kiss my ass. Jonathan, you can kiss my butt. I'll say it over and over again. Jonathan, you can kiss my butt. Ozzy, I thought you, you know, I thought we kind of had that cool connection, but you can kiss my butt too. Use a, uh, using it for yourself, so I see how it is, but you'll get yours because they already got a dagger out for you. You two, I feel, stabbed me the most, so both y'all can definitely pick a cheek and uh, kiss my butt. Number 38, when Penner gets interviewed on the early show, the host is basically the surrogate for casual audiences at the time. I know because I was one when this season aired, meaning I was a casual watcher of the show. You can't flip in Survivor or else you're a jerk. Wait, playing a rational game though means, <coughs> means flip-flopping? You were, you flip-flop more than a fish in a frying pan. My goodness. Well. You took it to, a, it was an art form with you. Thank you, and I would have done it again. <laughs> but do you take any responsibility at all? For, for your actions out there and the, and the flip-flopping. And I mean, listen, I, I mean, people, this, this game is about sure outwit, outlast, outplay, but isn't there some loyalty involved at some point? Well, I was loyal, I was loyal to- To who, to Jonathan? Well, I was loyal to Candace when I stepped off the mat the first time. Number 39. Penner was on many things before Survivor, and another was this little known show called The Naked Truth, where he plays a photographer who basically creeps on celebrities. This is the- picture I was nominated for. That's Helmut Kohl at the Zurich Economic Summit. It's got great light. Thank you. I have a picture of Queen Elizabeth. Not in her underwear, I hope, because that'd be just a little bit more of the crown jewels than I'd like to see. <laughs>
No, she is, however, giving me the finger. Really? Yeah. Are you sure she's not just doing that royal wave or... No, that's the finger. Yeah. <laughs> Number 40. Did you ever notice this season how Jeff cannot say Parvati's name right no matter what? It's a bit insulting. Though, to be fair, I struggle saying it correctly sometimes too. Well, Parvati says she tried correcting him many, many times. Good morning. Good morning. Parvati. Parvati. So Jeff got it wrong. He was just saying it poverty, poverty the whole time. I corrected him maybe six times. Okay. And finally, I think towards the end, he starts saying Parvati. Number 41. You may be wondering, what if this season had a final two? Ozzy wins the last immunity and takes Becky to the end. So, who would have you all voted for if this happened? If I had to vote between them, it would have been honestly a tough choice. I think Ozzy clearly would have won any name. other season. <laughs> if I had to choose, it probably would have been Becky. If only because, because you guys were tight from the beginning, right? We were tight from the beginning, and we did the show for very similar reasons. Number 42. On the flip side, let's say Yule wins the last immunity and takes Becky over Ozzy. Who does Ozzy vote for to win it all? If you, Ozzy, had to choose between <laughs> Becky and Yule winning, who would you have voted for? I would have picked Yule, of course. Oh. <laughs> Number 43. Back in the day, the winner did not get their million dollar check during the reunion or at the finale, but the morning after on the early show. So here is Yule getting his million. And we have to present him with this very big million dollar check. Yule, what are you going to do with the million dollars? You know, the amazing thing is whoever wrote this spelled my name right, which is something you don't see very often nowadays. Number 44. You may not know this, but Jonathan Penner wrote a horror movie that released a theatrically just a few years ago called The Bye Bye Man. I'm not really big in horror movies, so I have not personally seen it myself, but it wasn't a hit upon release. However, it seems like it's gained somewhat of a cult following online if the recent comments on the trailer are anything to go by. Number 45, one last time, Mad TV rip Survivor again when they parody a shelter building competition on their fictional Cook Island season. Let's check in with our teens and see how they're holding up. Wow, Team Burrito. <laughs> You have the greatest shelter in the history of the show. It's not for us. Team White Bread paid us three coconuts an hour to build it for them. <laughs> Team Soy Sauce, what happened to your shelter? Katina! <laughs> Find out who wins on the next Survivor. Number 46. This is the last secret, and it's a sweet one to end on. Yule got married after this season, and it wasn't because his wife saw him on the show, but actually because Brad helped them meet. You ended up meeting your wife because of Survivor, correct? I did. Yes. Yeah, totally. I got set up by Brad Verrata <laughs> from yes. my season uh, on a blind date. So yeah, I, you know, Survivor's given me a lot. Like, you know, I found a wife and I have kids, you know, all this stuff. So which secret surprised you the most? Comment below and let me know. Thanks for watching and doubly thanks for liking and subscribing. See you all next time.